Wednesday evening for that. Um, and uh, it's been great to see uh, how it's progressed throughout the, the weeks that we've been together. I was uh, watching from YouTube at different times and then been able to be here the last few times in person. So it's, uh, it's just awesome. We are uh, blessed tonight to, uh, well, before I do that, I'm going to pray. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for our whole night experience. We thank you for um, setting this time aside. Um, as Bishop Gary taught us, it's a tithe uh, for the year. And we, we give this, this time to you, Lord God, and we're thankful that, um, that you are going to make the journey once again um, through Holy Week to the cross and ultimately to the empty tomb um, to uh, allow us to know the hope of your resurrection. So we give you thanks, Lord God, and we know that you want to have a relationship with us, and we know that, that um, that's all about being a disciple of you and we're thankful. So guide us, lead us, and direct us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Todd Bolsinger is our uh, speaker this evening, and, and about two years ago, he was our speaker at a clergy conference. And uh, so that's when all the clergy and the diocese come together. Uh, a lot of people come because the bishop says you have to be there. So, uh, so he, had a, he had a captive audience, literally. Uh, but uh, but when, when Todd began to speak, I uh, was quickly reminded of a book that I read, you know, a long time ago, Canoeing the Mountains, and then um, and he spoke about that. And, and then Vestry this year, or 2023, read the book together, um, which was a very appropriate time for us to read it because it's about uh, adaptive leadership and how we have to build trust in order to lead people maybe off the map, you know, the normal map of church life. And um, so when Patrick re resigned and, and then retired, we were like, okay, here we go. We're, we're leading off the map, here we are. So, uh, We've got to adapt to this new new way of doing things and that kind of stuff. And it was um, just an incredible gift to us, your mm -hmm. book was, as well as um, your talks at clergy conference. Mm -hmm. And so when all of that converged, I said, I'm going to pick up the phone and call Todd and get him here. And, um, and he had an open evening. <laughs> so okay. we are incredibly thankful for that. And so meant to be without, uh, without any more introduction, because he um, needs all the time he can to teach us this evening, because he's a wealth of information. Please welcome to talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is, um, I'm going to stand up here so I can see my notes and see all of you. It is nice to be with you. I'm always aware that when you speak to people after a meal, you got to be particularly perky. Um, so I tell people, I mean, um, God can change your life after lunch or after dinner. God changed my life after lunch. I was going to be a national park ranger. That's what I was going to be when I grew up. And then I took biology after lunch. <laughs> and I slept through it. So I got such a bad grade, I became a pastor. Um, but because I'm a Presbyterian, I believe that was preordained from the beginning of time. So, um, so, so I will do my best to keep things lively, but um, I, I tell, I, that was a wonderful meal. Um, there was a, Justin sent me your goals for what you want for Lent, and there's one word that I picked up. He talked about wanting our faith to be revived. Reviving our faith means living in radical surrender to God's love and in courageous obedience to God's will. I love that. Radical surrender to God's love and in courageous obedience to God's will. What I want to talk about tonight and tell you a little bit about is some people who did that and how inspiring it is. But I want to start also by telling you about some people who didn't do that and what that causes to happen within us when we think about the comparison between the two. So um, Justin was describing what, what I do for a living is I'm a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary of Leadership Formation. That's what I do now. For 27 years, I was a Presbyterian pastor. I served 10 years at Hollywood Presbyterian Church in Los Angeles and then 17 years as the senior pastor at San Clemente Presbyterian Church, which is a church by the beach. So somebody has to suffer on that assignment, and that was mine. Um, and so for 
27 years, I pastored a congregation. So I just deeply love uh, pastoral work. And then um, 10 years ago, this month, Fuller Theological Seminary asked me to come and become a senior vice president in charge of helping them rethink theological education in a changing world. Um, I have a PhD in practical theology and a lot of work in leadership development. And so this became what I did. And so for six years, I helped the seminary think through how theological education needs to change. And, and now I get to spend every single day working with faith leaders trying to thrive as change leaders. That's what I do. I have my own little consulting company, AE Sloan Leadership, and I teach here at the school, and I run a project that basically researches that. So I'm a little bit like a, I say I'm a doctor who has my own medical practice, and then I keep teaching at the med school and doing some, uh, some stuff on that. So every single day I'm working with people on leadership, and my favorite definition of leadership comes from two guys from Harvard named Ronald Heifetz and Marty Linsky. Leadership is disappointing your own people at a rate they can absorb. <laughs> And, and why this is an important definition of leadership, and for any of you who serve in leadership in any place, and what I mean by leadership is more a skill than a position. It's not that you have a, necessarily a title and heavy furniture. It's that somehow you're the person who people look to because you have to make some things better. You can be a mom in a neighborhood who says, we need to put a stop sign on this corner because people drive through here too fast. If you're gathering people together to carry out a mission, then you're in leadership. And when you know you're really in leadership is when it's gonna require people to change because of it. When you have to take on a mission that's gonna require you to become something more than you've been. When you have to learn or grow or develop. So when I define leadership, I define it as energizing a community of people toward their own transformation in order to accomplish a shared mission. Which is why leadership is hard. Because we resist transformation, don't we? We want things to be the way they are, by and large. And we'd like to believe that we're fine and that we could just, with a little bit of extra oomph and a little bit of extra energy, we can just make things better. Until all of a sudden we find ourselves facing things that require us to be more than we think or more than we need to be. Uh, this is important. When I was at, uh, at the seminary, I was in a faculty meeting once, and the Old Testament professor said, I don't know why we teach leadership at a seminary. If you want a theology of leadership in the Bible, it's pretty simple. When God is leading, things are okay. When humans start leading, not so much. See Saul, right? But here's the way to understand leadership, at least the way I think about it and the way I teach it. It's hard to get a definition of leadership from the Bible because there's so many different experiences, good leaders, bad leaders, Leaders in one setting and another setting. But the best way to understand the difference between leadership is by looking at a different biblical category that's all over the Bible. It's the category of management. Now in the Bible, they don't call it management, they call it stewardship. If you take care of the things entrusted to your care and you hand them over to trustworthy people who will also take care of them, you're a good steward. And good stewards get... Um, lauded and appreciated, you know. Stewardship is about taking care of the things entrusted to your care. That's a definition from my colleague, Scott Cormode. And handing them over to other people who will be trustworthy also. Paul said, this is what we're doing when we do evangelism. We're being stewards of the gospel ministries of God, right? The things I've taught you, hand over to other people who will teach others also, right? So when I was a pastor, I realized every time... I was looking for a youth leader, you know, like every 18 months or so. <laughs> I was really looking for a youth manager. You take 10 kids to camp, you gotta bring 10 kids home. 90% is not an A at that one, right? <laughs> but what leadership is, is it requires transformation. So the manager tells Moses on the other side of the Red Sea, whew, that was something, that whole part of the Red Sea thing. Okay, we're here. We're heading to this place called the Promised Land. I've charted the maps. I've checked the GPS. Waze has a trek through here. We'll get this through. It's going to take us about six weeks. The leader knows it'll actually take 40 years because the people have to be transformed to become a people who can take the presence and the power of God into a new land. It's that transformation that is at the heart of leadership. And it's transformation that we resist.
why we need good leadership. So let me give you one particular story about this. Um, I know a church, I talked to a friend, we talked to a man who was told me a story about his, a 2,000 member church in the suburbs of Silicon Valley. It was planted by a charismatic pastor who was incredibly gifted, started with a handful of people, it grew rapidly through his preaching and through his presence. He was smart enough to realize the church was growing faster than he could handle as the pastor, so he got some very mature Christians around him. He recruited some people. Many of them had been part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. They were really good at doing ministry, and they cared deeply about the gospel being taught well. They began to become a church that cared deeply about preaching the whole counsel of Scripture. They not only taught about evangelism and reaching their neighbors, but they taught about social justice and care for the poor and... He loved to preach on the kingdom of God, and the church just grew. And together they began to grapple with two things. Number one was God was convicting their heart that they needed to be more and more involved in not only proclaiming the good news, but demonstrating it, particularly in acts of justice and mercy. But the second thing was they were a church plant. They were in a tent. They were setting it up every week and taking it down, and they were praying that God would give them a, a property, a place. And a property and a place came available. Not in the suburb that they were in, but in inner city San Jose. And they began to pray and think about this. And they thought, here's what we need to do. We, God has put on our heart that we need to be a church that not only proclaims the gospel, but actually demonstrates the good news to people who need justice. And we, if we moved into this neighborhood, we could transform it. 2,000 of us in this neighborhood, living out our faith, caring for the neighbors, caring about the people, doing acts of social justice and things like you guys do with food programs. Oh, my God. They got so excited that they announced that they were going to actually buy this property and the 2,000 of them were going to move from this suburb into this inner city. And it was a powerful celebration where 25% of the church showed up. They lost 75% of their church when he asked them to act upon what he'd been preaching. Curtis Chang, who told me this story after he had uh, talked about it on his podcast with David French, a uh, podcast that he had today uh, called The Podcast, he says, what we realized is that we had a very faithful mission. We had a vision of what God wants to do in the world that was faithful, but that our vision outstripped our formation. We, he said, we got the message right, but the, our formational method didn't work. Our TED Talk followed by a Coldplay concert was not enough. Our process of doing formation built on Sunday morning gatherings that were big and exciting and well produced and produ good production didn't work. He asked the question, do we have an inadequate methodology of formation? Well, part of the reason why this resonated with me when I heard him talk about this and why I actually emailed him and asked if I could interview him for my doctoral students is because I have spent the better part of, I spent the better part of all of the time of COVID asking some similar questions. Um, on March 13, 2020, when the world shut down, I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, talking to a group of 60 church planters. Um, they were in an area, I had just been in Tennessee, um, they weren't sure there was a thing called COVID. I was from California. I was pretty sure there was. At least there had been and there was in California. By the time I went through the Denver airport on my way back, um, the United Airlines flight attendant handed me a Clorox wipe. Not the little nice little branded things they offer you on the plane when you get there today. I mean, someone went to Costco, just got a big old box of bag of Clorox wipes, handed them out to people and said, hey, in order to keep us safe, um, we're asking everybody to wipe down the plane. And I'm thinking, you're United Airlines. <laughs> you keep people safe at 30,000 feet. You need the help of a pastor. This is a bad thing going on here. And sure enough, by the time I was home, we were sh our school had shut down, our work had shut down, I didn't get on a plane for 18 more months, and I went from traveling 100,000 miles a year to sitting at home in front of my computer doing this thing called Zoom that I'd never done before. I ended up doing 170 Zoom webinars. And what I did during that time is I would ask people, what are some of the challenges that, you're, that are being revealed in your church during this particularly stressful time? And I would ask them to type it into chat. Well, as a person who does research, this is gold, right? I'm just getting just feedback from people. 
And what I found is when I asked people of the crisis that were revealed during COVID, not the things that we have to manage, like we got to figure out how to get live stream or, I mean, what's the deeper things that show up here, that were here all along, that now are really evident because we're under stress? A whole list of things came out, but the first thing that everybody talked about was a lack of deep, pervasive discipleship. Most pastors told me our church was not as Christian as we thought we were. We asked them to love God and to love their neighbors, and mostly what they wanted to do was to stay at home and ask when we're going to start open the church again. They got mad when we asked them to wear masks to take care of the vulnerable people in our community, and they went started going to other churches that were more convenient, and we started realizing that these opportunities to actually be a witness, you know, you know, this is an interesting statistic. It's, 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 this, is a, this is a depressing part of the whole thing. It gets better later, I promise you. But um, there was stuff like this. Like for most of church history, every time there's a crisis in the world, the church grows. For the first 400 years of the church, every time Rome had a plague, which is just Roman for pandemic, the church grew because Christians were so different than everyone else their hope, their love, their generosity, what we began to realize is this could be the first crisis where the church declined, and declined rapidly. Tom Rayner, who's a guy who counts these things, says they've been tracking the, the decline of Christianity in the West for years. It's a slope. It's just going down. He said that where we thought we were going to be in 2027, we hit in 2022. COVID took five years of church membership from us. Five years. And it's exacerbated in the younger generations. We've been losing a million millennials and Gen Z out of the church a year for almost 20 years now. We all know this. Our churches are getting older. Our young people are less connected. This, this passive, this challenge, this pervasive lack of deep pervasive discipleship became apparent in so many places. I talked to a man who was a pastor of an 8,000 member church in a southern city. He quote, he wanted to get together and have a consultation with me because it's what I do as a coach and a consultant. And he looked at me and he said, after 34 years, I wonder if I'd wasted my life. I said, why? He said, because the way my people talk to each other on Facebook over the political divisions in our culture, they were vile to each other. We don't demonstrate a difference of faith. Now, now, maybe it's different here, and maybe now a few years later, we can feel like we are returning and people's faith is getting some traction again. But by almost every marker, the depth of Christian faith that serves as a witness to the world is not as strong as we'd hoped it to be. What my friend Curtis was telling about his church, our vision outstripped our formation. <laughs> Our desire to be an influence, to be a light to the world, a lamp unto their feet, to, to share the good news, to witness to the, good, to the good news of Christ, to lead people to Christ, to invite them, to welcome them, connect them, all the things we care about, are limited by the depth of our faith. We have a crisis of discipleship. Let me tell you a story now about a group of people who didn't have that crisis and about the difference they make. But let me start by telling you about the time that I cut 10,000 words out of a book I was writing. I was writing my most recent book called Tempered Resilience, a book that came out about four years ago. It was a book on resilience and leadership. And I had a story that I found. I wanted to find an example of a resilient leader, somebody who would be an inspiration to people. And so I found this story, and I'm going to tell it to you. It's a true story. On I, I ended up having to cut 10,000 words out of my book because I told this story. A knock at the door on a cold winter night in 1941. In a little tiny French village called Les Chambon sur lignon in the plateaus of southern France, there is a Huguenot religious community. Christians who were reformed Christians who had come there during persecution by Catholics generations before. They lived in this little mountain village away from everybody else. It's hard to get to, difficult there. 
But in a winter night of 1941, Magda Trokme, who was the wife of the pastor, Andre Trokme, heard a knock at the door, opened the door, and there in front of her was this haggard woman who was shivering in the cold. She had made her way to La Chambonne from Germany. She was Jewish. And she had heard that there was a group of people who were taking in refugees. So she went and knocked on the door. Magda immediately wel welcomed her in, threw a blanket around her, put her in front of the fire, had her take off her sandals. And while she was there warming herself in front of the fire, her sandals caught fire. So Magda went out that night to find another pair of sandals in anywhere in the village that they could give to this woman who would absolutely need them. And they took her in and they sheltered her. But this was a significant moment because the people of Les Chambon were people who had developed a reputation for welcoming Jewish refugees. All over France, people had come, refugees had come to find shelter in this village. The difference with this woman, however, is that she was Jewish but she was not French. She was German. She wasn't just a refugee, she was an immigrant. And for the first time, Magda got resistance. People said to her, will there, if we bring in this German woman, will there not be enough space for our French refugees? Maybe we should make a discernment about who we take in or who we not. Magda would have nothing to do with it. These are children of God, we're gonna welcome them all, we're gonna take care of them all, and they did. By every measure, they are, uh, the people of La Chambon are considered heroes. They saved somewhere between three and 5,000 Jews from deportation and concentration camps. This little village of Christians in the mountains. This all started because six months earlier, on June 23rd, 1940, when after the German occupation of France, when the Vichy French government declared that it would collaborate with Nazism and begin to turn over Jews and would begin to uh, collaborate with their oppressors, on June 23, 1940, her husband, Andre Trochme, took the pulpit of their little church and with Edward Thies, his assistant pastor, sitting next to him, they stood before and he gave what was called the Weapons of the Spirit Sermon. It includes this. I know it'll be hard to see, but I'll read it for you. He said, the duty of Christians is to resist the violence directed at our consciences with the weapons of the spirit. We appeal to all our brothers in Christ to refuse to agree or, with or cooperate in violence, to love, to forgive, to show kindness to our enemies. That is our duty. But we must do our duty without conceding defeat, without servility, without cowardice. We will resist when our enemies demand that we act in ways that go against the teachings of the gospel. We will resist without fear, without pride, and without hatred. But this moral resistance is not possible without a clean break from the selfishness that for a long time has ruled our lives. In this moment of crisis, the pastor stands before them and says, what we're going to do is act like Christians. <laughs> We're going to welcome, we're going to, be, we're going to be caring, we're going to even love our enemies. We're going to love people because we're going to act like Christians. But to do so, we must repent. We must grow. We must be aware that we are prone to selfishness and that we'll want our things our own way. He challenged them and six months later, they were taking people in in this remarkable story. Well, I had my story, right? I had my story of these resilient, amazing leaders who had to overcome and had to stand faithful. And so I decided that what I wanted to do was uh, learn more about the story. And I remembered that there had been a documentarian who'd done a documentary of them. There's a, there's a documentary called Weapons of the Spirit. It ha came out in the 1980s. It was done by a man named Pierre Sauvage. Pierre had been a baby who had been born in Les Chambon during the war. In the 1980s, he was in his 40s. But I thought, the movie's still got to be out there. The documentary's still got to be there. So I went and looked for it. And I couldn't find it. How do you not find a movie on YouTube? And there I was, looking for it and looking for it. And I couldn't find it. And so finally, I looked up Pierre Sauvage. And I found that the La Chambon Society that owns the right to the movies is in Los Angeles. 
And so I wrote to him and I said, I told him the story that I'd, about how inspired I was by the documentary that I'd seen so many years ago when I was in seminary. Could I get a copy of it? And he said, I'd be glad to get you a copy. We're in the middle of remastering it. That's why it's been taken down. We'd like to reissue it again. But would you like to talk? And I said, yes. So I got on the phone and I chatted with him and he told me his story. He's now in his 80s. And after telling him about what I, my project, I said, I'm just trying to understand who these people were. And he said, well, would you like to talk to Andre and Magda Trocme's daughter, Nellie? She was a teenager in Le Chambon. She's 93. So through email, I set up a phone call and I ended up talking to her about her. I said, I want to hear about your parents and I want to hear how they become these amazing leaders, these kinds of people who led a people through their, to overcome their own fears, to welcome these Jewish and German immigrants, to welcome anyone who comes, to faithfully live out the gospel in such an inspiring way. I want to know what was it that shaped them as pastors and leaders. And I'll never forget her voice when she said, you're very romantic about this, aren't you? <laughs> she said, you know, they weren't that different. They just lived out their faith. Isn't that what you Christians, you Christians, should be about? And all of a sudden, I had to cut 10,000 words out of my book. I didn't have a heroic leadership story. What I had was a story about this amazing group of people who thought they were anything but extraordinary. She said, this is just what they did. They were just trying to live out their faith. To love, to forgive, to show kindness to our enemies. That is our duty. But this moral resistance is not possible without a clean break from the selfishness that for a long time has ruled our lives. One of the most interesting parts is I found a documentary from Pierre Sauvage talking to Bill Moyers, and he makes this statement. He said that everybody assumes that people doing heroic deeds agonize over, what should we do? He said, I've come to believe that's not at all the case, that people who do heroic deeds do them because it's the most natural thing for them to do. He says, Agonize, don't act. And people who act, don't agonize. This is the challenge that struck me when I thought about the church today and the church that went through COVID and the church that we all know and how much we don't seem as if we're all that different than the world around us. You know, today, almost by every marker, there's very little differences between Christians and non-Christians. We have a tendency to be divided in exactly the same ways that our neighbors are divided. We have a tendency to basically be more connected to our political ideology than to our faith. We have a tendency to want things to be our way just like our neighbors do. There's so little distinctiveness and so little discipleship. And so we start asking ourselves these questions. What would it be like for them to describe us as being, these are simply people who were the way they were? Just people who live out their beliefs. Or as Matt, Matthew Peterson, who wrote an article about them, said, this leaves the rest of us with this question. How does a community create a culture such as this? A culture of what he called extraordinary, ordinary goodness. Matthew Peterson put it this way. What's transpired in La Chambon did not emerge from a single heroic decision as much as it did from a culture <coughs> containing within it a long memory of persecution. They knew what it was like to be persecuted. They themselves had been persecuted. A culture in which gathering around scripture was a daily practice. You know that they had years in between pastors. Andre Trochme was a pacifist and no one wanted a pacifist pastor in the middle of the war. So he ended up, the only job he could find was a job in this little tiny remote mountain town where they were so desperate for a pastor, they took him. But in all the years they didn't have a pastor, they learned to gather together around the scriptures themselves. What transpired in Le Chambon did not emerge from a single heroic decision as much as it did from a culture containing within a long memory of persecution. A culture which gathering around scripture was a daily practice a culture of both ordinary hospitality and stubborn resistance. 
And the question that I want to spend just a couple minutes with you on together is, what would it be like for us to develop that kind of culture? You see, the most transformative thing in the scripture is not the seed, it's the soil. The parable of the seed is really the parable of the soils, right? There's a farmer who goes out to sow the seed, spreads it around. Some falls on rocky soil, some falls on barren ground, some falls on thorny ground. They don't grow up very much, but that which falls on good soil bears fruit a hundredfold. Throughout the scriptures, over and over and over again, the organizational culture, the culture of the church, the culture is the soil. And what I want you to think about today during Lent and during this is not how can we do bigger, more better practices of discipleship? How can we have more programs about discipleship? How can we enter into more activities of discipleship? I want you, I want you to think about is how do we create a culture here that will grow extraordinary, ordinary Christians that will bear good fruit that remains? This is at the heart of what we call adaptive leadership. Adaptive leadership understands that it's that really big challenges, challenges that get us stuck, cannot be solved by trying harder. The answer to our discipleship issues is not to try harder. Here's one of my favorite quotes. It's from Edwin Friedman. Edwin Friedman was a Jewish rabbi who wrote about uh, organizational systems. That's what he did. He was a therapist, uh, he was a psychologist who'd studied what's called Bowenian family systems theory. What he basically believed is that healthy churches were like healthy families. Healthy families could have lots of different traditions and lots of different practices. They can do things a lot different ways, but healthy families will grow up healthy adults. The dysfunctional families, even if they do all the right things, get the kids to all the right activities, make sure that you get your homework done. If there's dysfunction, if there's toxicity, if there's anger, if there's addiction, you can do all the right things. And well, we know that people who come through those families, like my own broken home, we bear this, the scars of those experiences. He said, when any, he said, here's the way to understand it. When any relationship system is imaginatively gridlocked, just hear that phrase for a second. It's about my favorite one ever. The church is a relationship system. First and foremost, we're a relationship system. We know that theologically, we're members of one another. We're part of the body of Christ, the family of God. What he was saying is that we're psychologically a relationship system. It's the reason why when something happens in a church, you don't feel just angry, you feel betrayed. Like when you're hurt by the church, it goes really deeply. We're a relationship system. When any relationship system gets imaginatively gridlocked, I just want you to think about that phrase for a second. When was the last time you found yourself in a meeting where you were thinking, what could we do about this really hard problem? Like, reaching our kids or the next generation or uh, trying to reach our neighbors who aren't interested in coming or trying to grow our church when it feels like it's declining or whenever you're finding yourself stuck and you say, we're going to think outside the box. We're going to be as creative as possible. You spend three hours and you realize all you did was argue about the box. <laughs> if you've never been in a conversation or a meeting with imaginative gridlock, let me invite you to a faculty meeting. <laughs> Because the more people, the higher up people get in degrees, the more status they get, the more experience they get, the more get, they get locked into their mental models. They start arguing about their perspectives. They're stuck. When any relationship system is imaginatively gridlocked, it cannot get free simply through more thinking about the problem. Conceptually stuck systems cannot be unstuck simply by trying harder. What I want to do before I give you the last pieces to think about is this. Whatever this challenge of discipleship is, whatever it is we need to do to become the kinds of people who raise up folks who would demonstrate the good news of the gospel naturally in our lives, it's not going to happen through trying harder. We will exhaust ourselves trying new programs, trying new ideas, trying new things. It's like we're paddling the canoe where there isn't any water. You're just going to burn out and blow out your rotator cuff and be exhausted and not get anywhere. 
Conceptually stuck systems cannot be unstuck simply by trying harder. For a fundamental reorientation to occur, that spirit of adventure which optimizes serendipity and which enables new perceptions beyond the control of our thinking processes must happen first. What does that mean? Optimizes serendipity, enables new perceptions. The answer is we need to learn and we need to see things differently. We need to learn to see our problems before I solve our problems. So this is the big challenge, I believe, of the part of the process we have together. To think about a, our leadership as what's called an adaptive challenge. An adaptive challenge that requires learning, that results in facing loss, that it relies, that we're, that relies on a diversity of perspectives, that it reveals competing values, and that will require resilience in the face of resistance. It's about our being transformed not are trying to solve the problem. So what did we learn from Les Chambon? What transpired in Les Chambon did not emerge from a single heroic act. It was through developing a culture, a culture of history and a culture of gathering around scripture, a culture of practice and a culture of, of ordinary hospitality and a culture of cultivating humility and learning and courage and empathy, of diversity of perspectives, of missional clarity. How do we develop this kind of culture? So let me just give you two, two things, two examples and I'll finish and we can talk about this some more. One from the early church and one from brain science. From the early church, this is what we learned. Do you know in the first 400 years of the church, the church grew more rapidly than any other time in the church? If you know anything at all about church history, you know that we grew exponentially in the first 400 years. In those 400 years, when the church grew the fastest, when there was the most amount of evangelism and there was the most amount of, of uh, church planting, when more people were becoming Christians, you know what you don't find in the early church? Any teachings or tracts or documents about evangelism or church planting at all. They taught character formation. You know what they did for 400 years? They taught character formation. For 400 years, what the church did, the reason why it grew is it grew by developing remarkable people. It focused on character formation. And so in the early church, what we learned from a guy named Alan Kreider is that when challenged about their ideas, Christians pointed to their actions. The emphasis of, of formation was to create a place where people at, walked their talk. They believed what they were going to live and they lived what they were going to believe. And their behavior was in their beliefs and in the enactment of their message. That over and over again, the explosion of the church was not organized. It was not the product of mission programs or of evangelism programs. It simply happened. Further, the growth was not carefully th thought through early Christian leaders did not engage in debates about mission strategies. They did not write a single treatise on evangelism. You know what they wrote about? Patience. They wrote about the character formation of perseverance. The imagery they used was that of ferment. Think about the difference between a swill and beer. What's the difference between something that's sitting there spoiling and something that might be fermenting? What's the difference between something that is a culture that has gone bad and a culture that is being transformed? The difference between sauerkraut that you could take on the road or kimchi that you could eat in a meal or beer that you can enjoy with a family and that which is going bad and spoiling and needs to be let go. You know the difference? One bubble, one act of life. One little boop. One person who cares for a neighbor. Boop. Who finds a pair of shoes. Boop. Who says to someone else, doesn't matter if they're French or German, there are people. Boop. One act of faithfulness in a community that over a long period of time begins to shape us and form us into people who make a difference. A culture of transformation. That culture is ultimately the ultimate culture of, that depends. That, that culture is ultimately transformational. So let me tell you all that to tell you this. 
When people study the cultures that are most transformative to people, the single biggest attribute they have, the sign of the Spirit, is the presence of joy. Joy. Do you know how brain scientists define joy? There's a group of people at UCLA that define joy this way. Joy is the experience you have when you see someone who is glad to see you. Or here's the way to think of it. There's an old prayer that goes like this. Dear God, please make me the kind of person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> I have a 95 pound Bernese mountain dog who when I come home, she greets me like she is a toy poodle. This 95 pound dog spins in circles and licks and jumps on me and jumps down and can't wait. She's so glad to see me. When was the last time that you showed up into church and everybody greeted you like you were coming home and they were your Labrador retriever? The most powerful thing, according to brain science, the most transformative things is knowing that when you are welcomed into a place that is looking for you, the one, most transformative attribute in the life of the church is joy. Joy is not just the happiness we have because of circumstances. Joy is the relational experience of seeing people who are thrilled to see you. It's Norm coming into cheers, right? Norm! It's people seeing you and being glad to be with you. It's the experience of seeing someone's face. I had an aunt named Dorothy. Her eyes sparkled when she saw me. And when I was a 12-year-old, dumpy, little, dorky, fat kid, I'd come in and she would look at me and she would say, you are beautiful. I believe that why our discipleship is struggling today is because we're trying to use too many programs, locked in too many things, that are trying too hard, and we've lost our joy. The most transformative process we can have is to become a kind of people who so deeply love and welcome each other that it, you are transformed to be in the midst of it. Now, I'd like you to do something. I'm going to break up your pattern for just a moment. I'd like you just to do this. I'd like you to turn to the person next to you just for two minutes, two minutes. I'm a professor. I get to do this to you for two minutes. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to say this. What was the most transformative group you've ever been part of? What was the group? Was it, what was the group of people who most transformed your life? I'm not going to make you say it publicly, but I want you to think about, was it a family? Was it a team? Was it a military group? Was it a work group? The most transformative group you were ever part of. And what was it about them that so transformed you? Just tell the person next to you, because it's more important that you say it than that we hear it together. And I promise you, I won't make you say it out loud. Just turn to the person next to you. Just two minutes, and we'll be back.
Pero bueno. Give you one more minute. Okay, so let me cut back in. I'm going to tell you, give you one last piece, and then I'm going to give you one last story, and then we'll do some uh, question and answers. You can talk about this. So if we start thinking about how do we create the kind of culture in a church like this that would be genuinely transformative? I mean, when there's a crisis, we don't have to agonize. We just act. When people come and they need us, we show them the love of Christ. That it's almost, um, it's so ordinary in our Christianity that people are unsurprised because that's, of course, the way they would act. Because we would just genuinely be people who live out the gospel of Christ. That kind of transformation. We know that one of the qualities is that human beings are more transformed when their environment's filled with joy. When you are find a place where people, you are genuinely loved and you are valued. When you are welcomed, when you are necessary. And that one of the most powerful things that we can have is a community where we feel like we are a part of it. It's bigger than ourselves. It's not just something we do in our own spiritual practices at home. Those, those are important. And it's not what we just do in our programs. That part of what happened in discipleship in the last 20 years is discipleship became either about institutional things we do to create and sustain the institution, right? Discipleship became training people to be Sunday school teachers and deacons and acolytes and good things, but they were not as transformative. Or it became deeply personal, like what you and I do, because we, so we can sleep better and be more meditative and be calmer. And we're like the Christian version of the Calm app. Good things. But we're trying to talk about how can we be genuinely transformative? Well, I asked you about a transformative experience. Let me tell you what a group of researchers found in a business, in a company, in three different companies that were so deeply committed to the transformation of their people that they made their bottom line, what they reported to their shareholders and their board of directors, two things. We will do everything we can to maximize profits, but we are also going to be a place that furthers the development of all of our people. These are called, in, they're called deliberately developmental organizations. Deliberately developmental organizations. They're organizations that have a dual bottom line. We're going to fulfill our mission and we're going to develop our people. Does that sound like the church or what? And yet they do it as publicly traded companies. When they study these companies, these businesses, that don't have any faith behind it. They're just people who, they just believe that they'll be a more competitive business if they invest and transform their people. When they studied them and they asked them, what are the attributes of those businesses? This was the response they got. They did all these surveys, brought in all these consultants. They did all this stuff. But if you did a word cloud on the attributes that all three of these companies shared, it came down to three words. People described the community as being filled with trust, pain, and care. Trust, pain, and care. What do they mean by this? Trust. We trust that everybody in this community is living by the same values. Trust comes when everybody, doesn't matter who it is, top to bottom, highest to lowest, CEO to the person who is brand new, bishop to pew, doesn't matter. We're all committed to the same values. We all, that's what a healthy, aligned organization, high trust is when people are all committed in the same direction. We trust it. We're not cynical. High trust. And because there's high trust, we can embrace pain. 
but it's a very particular type of pain. It's the pain of vulnerability. It's the pain of being able to acknowledge where you need to grow. It's about your development, right? It's the pain where everybody in the organization can say stuff like, look, I got people in my, on my sales team who are better listeners than I am. I might be their boss, but I know that my blind spot is I'm not a good listener, so I'm working on my listening skills. Or someone else can say, I know that I'm really good at inspiring people, but I'm not good at follow through. It becomes natural for everybody to be vulnerable about what they are working on to grow. They call it working on your back end. You know, like in tennis or pickleball? You ever watch new people playing pickleball? They just keep running around wanting to hit with their forehand, right? But if you actually want to get better, you got to get to the place where you work on the weak side. High trust. We're all committed to the same values. High pain. It's hard to be vulnerable. But we're all committed to the pain of vulnerability. And then high care. We're all committed to caring for people as they grow. And care doesn't mean comfort. Our goal as an organization is not that everybody's comfortable, it's that everybody is cared for while they're dedicated to their own growth in an environment where we all share the same values. This to me feels like La Chambon. What was it? They had a culture. A culture where they had a shared history, a culture where they had shared practices, a culture where they were all de dedicated to the same thing, we're going to shelter these people. They were all dedicated to acknowledging where they needed to grow. Remember his statement? We're going to live, forgive, love, forgive, do our duty, but we have to repent of the selfishness of our lives, our backhand. Trust, pain, care. What would it be like? to be a congregation of people who welcomes a new rector by saying, we have a set of values we all live by. Not everybody does, but those of us who are committed, you know the kind of people who show up on a Wednesday night to listen to a professor from California? <laughs> We're committed to being more vulnerable, more open about where we need to grow, that it's okay to not have it all perfectly worked out. It's safe. And we're committed to carrying people into that transformation. Trust, pain, and care. Ordinary, extraordinary goodness in a culture that's not a separate program, but is at the very heart of the person out, of the co congregation. That's the way, place where I believe we'll get that kind of revival that will give us courageous obedience to the will of God. Okay, let me take just a couple of minutes of any questions you have, and then I'm going to finish with the final story because I like this is one of my favorite stories. So before we're done, I'll tell you it, but we'll go. I'll just say that. 